It is a pleasure to host this event today uh, to facilitate discussions between climate scientists and humanitarians on the use of forecasts, uh, climate forecasts for anticipatory action. Uh, please note that this event is being recorded and the recording will be made available as well as the slides after the event. For the format, we will have four great speakers um, that will give five presentations of five to 10 minutes uh, each. And after the presentations, we will have a group discussion. You can already uh, use the Q&A function within um, WebEx to submit your own questions, and we hope to hear from you during the presentations. Uh, before we get started, um, maybe I can provide a little bit of background to situate um, our audience today. So the Center for Humanitarian Data is um, a part of OCHA, and our mission is to increase the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. A focus of our work is to provide analytical support in the development of OCHA anticipatory action frameworks. What is anticipatory action? Some of you may not know, so please allow me to give you a quick overview. Uh, anticipatory action takes a proactive approach to humanitarian crises by acting not based on observed humanitarian need, but rather on risk, so the risk of a shock. So anticipatory action is based on a response based on risk rather than on needs. Necessarily, then, we are trying to get ahead of an actual shock and need to be able to predict the, so the shock itself in order to um, take action at the right time. This necessarily then depends on um, the ability to predict that shock, which usually relies on information such as climate forecasts, which are developed by climate scientists and other technical experts for non-climate related shocks. And this is what brings us here today, where we wanted to take the opportunity to really explore the trends, patterns, successes, and opportunities in using climate products in, to inform humanitarian response. I would invite um, our speakers uh, to turn on their camera so I can uh, introduce you uh, to our attendees. Maybe I will start with uh, Andy Kuchevich. There you go. Andrew has uh, extensive experience working on the intersection of climate science and humanitarian action. As senior staff research associate at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, IRI, he researches how climate models can inform early action. At the same time, he is a science advisor at the Red Cross, where he provides his knowledge in support of building anticipatory action frameworks. Today, he will introduce us to the world of climate models and explain key concepts that should be considered when applying them in humanitarian contexts. Zaudu Segele um, is our next guest. Zaudu has seen the abilities of climate models improve over the years as he has been doing amazing work at the IGAD Climate Prediction and Application Center, abbreviated as ICPAC. As senior climate modeling expert, he has been on the forefront of improving ICPAC's forecasts and their use. Today, he will share how ICPAC's regional models complement the global models and pro the products they offer. Gabriela Nobre is an expert on the application of forecasting models and climate data for risk management. During her PhD research, she investigated the role of climate variability on the predictability of flood and drought risks. Now she continues her research as a postdoc at the university. I'm sorry, I will not be able to read the Dutch name, but the VU at Amsterdam. Gabriela, please feel free to name the, the university, but is also working as an anticipatory action specialist at the Research Assessment and Monitoring Division at the World Food Program. She will show us how WFP has been using climate data and seasonal forecasting for anticipatory action against droughts in Mozambique. And finally, my colleague Tinka uh, Valentine is also joining us to share some of the learnings and um, anticipatory action frameworks and shocks that we have been working on at the Center for Humanitarian Data as well. With this background, very excited to uh, start hearing and learning from our speakers. So maybe I would turn uh, things over to Andrew and ask uh, you to kick us off. Uh, hi, everybody. So sorry about that. Welcome. I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, thank you so much, Jose and the Center for Humanitarian Data. Um, today, we're going to be talking a bit about 
yeah, more broadly about weather and climate models and model output and questions around opportunities, challenges, constraints, and key considerations when thinking about how to integrate, how to choose, how to prioritize different weather models when we're thinking about developing anticipatory action programs or other decision-making contexts within the humanitarian uh, space. So I'm very glad to be to be joined by the other amazing speakers today. And yeah, my talk is going to talk is going to be a bit more high level about some of the almost ba let's say basics or key principles for weather and climate models that uh, humanitarian actors might be interested in. Let's see if I could change slides. Yes. So today the three goals of the talk be talking about understanding elements of weather data forecasts and projections just a few minutes on that talking about time scales uh, what is a climate forecast go over some terms that perhaps many have heard but there could potentially be a lack of clarity what do we mean by skill what do we mean by seasonal climate forecast what do we mean by climatology we'll be touching on that a bit um, setting the base for a lot of what else will be shared the rest of today the second part, I'm going to be showing an example of what we're doing, myself and my team, on developing the first flash flood anticipatory action, um, early action protocol um, in Ecuador. So perhaps many have known in anticipatory action, there's many, um, many types being developed, but we're working on flash floods as a particularly unique and challenging hazard. And then we'll end just with a slide on some of reflections on trends and things that I've heard um, from, from being in both spaces. I should start by saying I am a meteorologist and in, uh, in, uh, working on the science side of anticipatory action, but feel very privileged to have access and ability to work also with the Red Cross. So, so being at that intersection, sharing some ideas on trends uh, for this community. So we're gonna start off just by the basic about seasonal climate. What are we talking about seasonal climate? What is climatology? So I selected one map here which shows the climatology of rainfall for October. Uh, and this could be seen as a snapshot of what, it, what to reasonably expect. If we're thinking about where we might see rainfall in the month of October, this map may be useful. Areas where we see greens into yellows, that's where we're seeing the darker greens into yellows where we see more rainfall in, in October. And the question to think of here, like, is this useful? It could be useful if you're interested in making decisions for actions to take place in October, sure. But is it a forecast? And that's something to, that I would like everyone to think about throughout this talk. Is it a for, are these tools forecasts? Are these representations of risk? And are these sufficient and ideal to be integrated in your decision-making uh, context? So next, let's see, next slide. There we go. And with seasonal climate, we expect month to month shifts. So the top we have October rainfall, what we would expect. In the bottom we have February rainfall, what we would expect. And we see some differences. I would like to highlight Brazil. In October, we see the, the darker, lighter to darker greens, just a couple uh, pockets of yellow in the west of Brazil. But then in February, we see yellows and reds throughout much many parts of Brazil indicating more rainfall. So is this a forecast? If we're talking about these expected shifts, is this a forecast? And is this variable ideal for your decision-making process? Is it sufficient? Because what we're seeing here is not total rainfall. This is a different metric. This is days per month with measurable rainfall. Now, is this necessarily indicative of floods? That's a good, that's a good question. And I think that it's important to say not necessarily. There are different types of ways to represent rainfall. And this is just one. We will go through other others, but one of the key takeaways here is many times maps are shown without describing the complete context, and it is important to look down in the details of what uh, what is being shown. So that's seasonal climate, and here we have seasonal climate shifts. So that's a little bit different than changes month to month. So before we're showing the difference between October and February and how rainfall patterns change. What we're seeing here is a representation of what might happen from season to season in different calendar years. The map here is called La Nina in Rainfall. This is a map produced by um, my team at IRI. And the question that this map answers is, if we are having a La Nina, which we're, which we're in right now, if we're having a La Nina, where might we expect to see shifts and what months may we expect to see those shifts and 
what types of shifts may occur. So in areas where you see green here, that's indicating where we are likely to see wetter than average conditions. And if we look at the months, it tells us what months we may see those shifts. So if I highlight Southern Africa, for example, in November to April, which is the months that we're coming into now, when we have La Nina, we can tilt the odds in favor of having wetter than average conditions. Now, this isn't always the case. So I want, so it's a good question to think, is this a forecast? You know, what it really is, is a representation of historical data and historical patterns. Um, can it be used to, to, let's say, allow us to glean and have an idea of what might happen? Yes, but there's other products that are updated more recently that have a snapshot of what's happening right now that should be coupled when you're interested in asking questions of what might happen in the future months, even when we have maps like this that say, when we have La Nina, we are likely to see shifts. Next slide, please. Okay, so then it comes to seasonal climate forecasts. So is this a forecast? Well, forecast is in its name. So the, the bet, it's, it's a good bet that this is a forecast. Um, but before we, we were showing what La Nina may do, and then what we're showing here is, well, the question that this answers is, what might we see in the next couple months, given what we know now? And I'm not showing the current forecast yet, because I wanted to show this comparison and kind of take us uh, out of context a bit. Um, but these are two products that were issued in, issued in July. Uh, the one on the right is from ECMWF, so the European Center uh, for Weather Forecast. And actually, this is the C3S system. So the data comes from a variety of centers that you see in the top right of that chart on the right. And on the left, uh, we see the IRI forecast. And there's some differences. Um, there's some similarities. So I'd like to highlight one if we just click here. Let's see, next slide. Yes. So if we focus on Northern South America, um, on the right, the C3S system, we're seeing above average forecast for above average rainfall in northern South America. And if you look on the left, we see the IRI forecast. Well, we're seeing more mixed signals. Again, this is July, issued in July for August, September, October. So perhaps there are some people on the call that could speak to if we saw these conditions evolve. Um, and maybe that's a discussion we could have later. But these are global products. And that's another important takeaway of this, this part of the session. Global products are used to present global snapshots. And it's also important to understand there's local and regional data and forecast data that can be considered. If we're looking here, uh, we could see this is the regional uh, rainfall outlook that covers some of the same period. And if we look at Northern South America, there's a couple of um, a couple of polygons that indicate, well, yes, a tilt in the odds for above average rainfall, but to a different magnitude than we're seeing at the global product. So next, the next uh, slide, ask some questions. So if we're thinking which is the best, we must think which one do we trust? And there's a lot that, that is wrapped into that idea of trust, the idea of mandates, the idea of responsibility. And it's one of the key points of thinking about forecasts, many times they do differ. Sometimes there's a small difference, sometimes a significant difference, but those differences are very important when we're trying to justify prioritizing and deprioritizing anticipatory action. Next slide, please. So the current seasonal forecast, I'm hoping that many have, have taken a look at this. On the left, uh, we see that there, are, there is currently a La Nina and there is a trend for La Nina to to uh, maintain. And then we see that the probability of La Nina is outweighed by neutral probabilities in around the February, March, April season. But what does that mean in terms of impacts? Uh, on the right, we see the current seasonal forecast issued from IRI um, in October, the most recent one for November, December, January. And yeah, if we highlight Southern Africa, for example, this is consistent with what we would expect from La Nina. If we think back to the question, in a La Nina year, what do we expect? Um, this is a nice product to kind of check that. You know, are we, are we seeing La Nina-like signals in the areas that we would expect it? And in Southern Africa, we're starting to see that evolve in the forecasts. But this is only one forecast. Next slide, please. And it's important to note that there are other products, other global products that, depending on your context, should be uh, referenced. Next slide. So we have on the top um, the ECMWF product, a global product. 
Um, the WMO also creates a kind of combination from different different centers, but this data is available. Now on the bottom, we have the IRI seasonal forecast. Now there's some key differences and similarities for these. So uh, next slide. The similarities, they both are showing where might we see tilts in the odds for wet and dry conditions. And um, they're both indicating magnitudes of those tilts in the odds. You know, maybe some places we're just seeing a slight tilt in the odds. Some are seeing a very strong tilt in the odds. Um, and we also see time scale as similarities. You, these are produced for the next three months. Uh, next slide. There are also some key differences. The top two um, show coverage on land and ocean when IRI does not, just, IRI just shows land. The map projection is a bit different. So sometimes it's hard to compare like this. Um, the color scale is also different in these. So while it's, while it is, it could be a good idea to look at these. In some cases, it should sh they should be referenced. And um, there are important differences here that I would I wanted to point out. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next part, just quickly talking a bit more about mandates, trust, and use. There's a lot of data available, um, but that's far from being used. And I know my colleagues will touch on this a little bit later. Um, skipping down to the dissemination of data products tools. Dissemination is not integration. Um, there, it, it could potentially be detrimental to the decision-making process. More data is not always better. Um, and there should be more discussions on accountability. I know the Center for Humanitarian Data does a lot, of, a lot of good work on understanding accountability around development and dissemination of data. And it's the same thing in seasonal climate forecast, and it's the same for anticipatory action. So just leaving it here, I know we're short on time, but I wanted to, to leave it here. Um, just some reflections, you know, again, of being at the intersection of climate science and in the humanitarian sector. Um, it, this it really is a privilege and I see it that way. The opportunity to understand risk is a privilege. And I'm glad to see many discussions that are happening around this, around accountability, about understanding uh, what is our responsibility of intervening and influencing these, de these decisions. And a lot of these discussions do come to a point when we have to manage uncertainty. Uncertainty is not necessarily something to be afraid of. It's not a bad word. It's actually what enables a lot of our forecasts to be possible. So I wanted to leave it at, uh, at that. You know, these are some points that we have been thinking about that I wanted to present here. Um, but so many times it comes back to that uncertainty. How do we manage that? How do we integrate it? And how do we communicate it in order to set expectations in a responsible way? So thank you very much for listening. I put my email there and I at the bottom and I very much look forward to the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for this great overview of global products. Very interesting. And I think every one of your slides could uh, in and by itself be another talk. So um, we will talk again for sure. In the meantime, we will be shifting gears a little bit still on the climate si science side, uh, but looking at more regional and local products. Uh, thanks to Zaudu. Uh, over to you, Zaudu. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be talking um, about um, this climate services that we provide uh, to complement the global um, uh, products um, and to customize um, forecast for the region. Uh, so ICPAC provides, it's not moving. All right. Uh, so ICPAC uh, provides regional climate services for the Greater Horn of Africa, um, starting from Sudan in the north to um, Tanzania in the south. Um, one of the main venue main mechanism uh, we provide climate services is uh, the so-called the, the ARCO for the regional climate outlook forum called the uh, greater horn of africa climate outlook forum uh, in this forum um, regional users and the member state uh, um, stakeholders engage with researchers uh, decision makers and um, um, climate providers to develop um, and co-produce uh, climate services uh, develop uh, advisories that can be used. So prior to 2019, uh, the GACOF um, depends primarily on, uh, largely on consensus-based uh, seasonal forecast. 
um, it, that has a lot of uh, drawbacks, um, include, including the subjectivity, and that the forecasts are not reproducible because of that subjectivity. Uh, since May 2019, ICPAC um, um, implemented so-called objective seasonal forecasting approach following the recommendation of the uh, WMO. Um, so this is using um, um, predefined methodology approach algorithm to produce a forecast, a seasonal forecast. Um, these forecasts are reproducible. Um, if uh, the forecasts are given to any group of forecasters, so they will produce the same forecast. It is traceable, it is documented. What process went into this forecast is provided, uh, documented. And it's verifiable, it's very, very important. I mean, in order to have that trust that Andrew talk, talked about. Um, how good, how reliable is the forecast? And that requires a real-time verification. And um, the forecasts are, uh, calibrated um, or um, systematic uh, errors are removed. I will discuss later on. And uh, the forecasts are digital for. It means the forecasts are available for use in application models, um, for example, for hydrology or agriculture and so forth. Um, so this quality of objective forecasting um, um, is obtained from uh, would you please uh, move it? I couldn't move. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, um, from the process of downscaling. Um, uh, so um, by downscaling, the purpose of it is to increase um, the details of the information. Um, downscaling increases the spatial and the uh, temporal resolution in areas where um, um, there are complex topography um, or where there are orographical features, as is the case uh, in the Greater Horn of Africa, or, um, lake um, um, and vegetation surface characteristics. Those value, those um, characteristics add to um, the global model, um, which runs at a lower resolution, uh, typically 100 kilometers. Um, uh, the other one is calibration or um, the removal of the systematic error in the model by training the forecasts, uh, the global forecasts using regional data that may not be shared with the um, globally through the, uh, the GTS. Uh, we will be able to use information to tailor it or to improve the uh, forecasting capacity or capability or ability of the model. So at ITPAC, um, we download data from global centers and the lead centers, including from IRI and uh, the C3S, and uh, statistically downscale. Uh, most of our monthly and seasonal forecasts are based on statistically downscale products. Um, we also dynamically downscale um, that is using the models, uh, models, um, physical, um, that follow physical laws to downscale to a higher resolution temporarily as well as spatially. Um, these are produced to, uh, for short range forecasts, for weather forecasts and the 10 daily forecasts, weekly forecasts. Um, and also um, to assess, to, to predict onset or the intra-seasonal characteristics of uh, um, seasonal forecasts, including onset and dry spells. Um, would you please move? Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, I'm showing here a few of the examples um, that we produce. Um, so usually um, seasonal forecasts are typically are useful for planning purposes. But those seasonal forecasts have to be monitored through um, a short-term forecast, right? Uh, so one of the products we provide is um, a weekly forecast. Uh, it includes the temperature, wind, uh, um, uh, rainfall, etc. cetera. Um, the top panel show on the, on the left shows extreme rainfall. So what this shows is um, which areas have a high probability of receiving rainfall 
um, that are beyond observed, at least 90% of, um, um, of past observation. If they, can, if they extend or exceed those thresholds, the 90 percentile or 95 percentile, or if it is the top 1%, we show that by a different color shown in the bottom from light blue to dark blue. Um, so these are produced, uh, they have um, shorter uh, time scale, they are provided uh, every week. Uh, the other is uh, um, we use also um, the um, dynamic regional models to track tropical cyclones or storms when they develop uh, in over the Indian Ocean during March, April, May or um, September, October, November, December, that is the seasons where we expect the tropical cyclones, tropical storms. We then track them, track those uh, um, storms to see where the, the landfall and what the extreme rainfall is. This is va val valuable um, prediction tools for early warning. Uh, seasonally, in addition to probabilistic forecasts um, uh, and uh, probability of uh, Exceedance forecasts uh, exceeding a, a given threshold. We also provide um, seasonal uh, the standardized precipitation index. So this is a common uh, drought indicator. Um, three months um, SCPI indicates a short to medium term um, variability. It affects the crop uh, if it is extremely dry or um, or reservoir level, depending on. Um, the actual um, 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 prediction um, and or magnitude of the forecast. Uh, we can also associate the magnitude of the SCPI forecast with uh, um, with past drought conditions uh, to assess their impact so that we can um, um, identify thresholds that can be used to forecast um, uh, to trigger anticipatory actions. Um, my last slide is uh, to show, would you please move? Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, this um, one of um, important information that the user needs in order to have trust is the um, reliability of the forecast. Since we started this objective forecasting, we show uh, the real-time verification. Um, the top panels show from uh, um, to 2019, when we started to uh, last uh, and the um, season of summer, uh, and the bottom panel shows the actually observed precipitation expressed in the same form as the probability tersile forecast. So we can see where our forecasts fail or where our forecasts are good. And such objective verification, along with their metrics, uh, can help us improve um, the reliability further. Thank you very much. Um, I've provided some li links uh, where um, more information can be obtained. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very clear of the presentation. And you mentioned at least two items that I think we will, we are about to hear more uh, about, which is uh, the impact of those climate shocks or conditions on crop productions, essentially the humanitarian impacts that might follow from a climate shock. And also the role of downscaling, which is for the humanitarian uh, perspective, very valuable and critical even in getting the right level of specificity and detail to inform operations. So thank you for uh, the presentation. I think that is a perfect transition to what Gabriel Gabriela, our next speaker, uh, will be talking about. So Gabriela, uh, I will pass it over to you to hear more about how you have been using those climate models uh, to inform your own activities at WFP. Thanks, uh, Jose, and uh, good day, uh, everybody. I just would like to um, yeah, mention uh, that this work is, uh, is a big collaboration uh, between uh, several uh, WFP uh, partners, and it's just not a work that has been developing at headquarters uh, level, but it's also a work that we've been uh, developing together with country office and also many stakeholders uh, in the region. So uh, today, if you could uh, move next. I would like to uh, give you just an overview of, of how we've been applying these, um, uh, these forecasting systems for developing uh, drought forecast-based financing 
or the anticipatory reaction plan. You can go next. Um, basically, the, the idea behind the forecast-based financing, as you all um, have heard already, it's uh, the opportunity of using these uh, forecasting systems for putting in place anticipatory reactions that, uh, when uh, done in timely, can still uh, reduce the impacts of the droughts. Uh, next, please. Uh, what we have been doing is uh, over these past two years is basically trying to uh, pilot a methodology for these uh, for eight districts uh, across uh, Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, very early we came to realize that uh, you know designing this drought forecast based financing is just not a matter of uh, having access to the data, processing the data, but also involves um, it, it goes way beyond uh, just data analysis. So let me. Uh, show you a little bit more of some of the key considerations that we have been taking for drought forecast based financing. Uh, next, please. Um, next. Uh, basically, uh, the starting point for our uh, analytical work was really around understanding what are the what are the you know what are the resulting impacts of the droughts and also in the pilot region uh, in which we want to implement the methodology also when do they happen so uh, what you can see here is basically a snapshot of the you know the, the climatology also the in, in a combination with uh, livelihoods uh, that we would like to to assist with our anticipatory action plans uh, so um, you can go next uh, also, in connection to understanding, you know, the dynamics of the climates and livelihoods, uh, uh, something that's very important as well is to understand really what 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 kind of actions can we take to prevent some of these uh, impacts, but also when should these actions be triggered. So, if you click next, you can see that uh, within WFP, what we have done was really to try to identify what could be the window for opportunity for implementing anticipatory action plan that could still, uh, if implemented in time, reduce some of the impacts. Um, and if you click next, uh, you'll see that um, uh, then it finally comes to the starting point of trying to understand from the data, then what, which kind of information can I extract from this seasonal forecast that has both a skill and also lead time for guiding some of our operations. So if you click next, you will see that um, actually uh, the, the forecasting information allow us to uh, put in place this anticipatory action plan. But I also would like to highlight that it's very important to have a monitoring system to also um, act as a kind of a shadow model for the forecasting. Because what you see is that sometimes these forecasting models, uh, well, they're not perfect, they have uncertainties, and they might miss an event that you're interested on. Um, so it's very important to also have in place a monitoring system to allow you still to uh, this early response and to reach the communities uh, at an inappropriate time. And then when we, uh, when we came to, you know, frame this problem, then we then started moving into the dynamics of understanding the data. So if you click next, um, and I can click again. Um, here you can basically, uh, next please, you can see a kind of a, an overview of the data that we use for setting up this uh, drought forecast based financing system. So basically, uh, the information that we collect, it's divided in two pieces. One, it's um, you want to have a good records, a good data set that can cover a long period of time. And for that, uh, we have been using the CHIRPS data set uh, for extracting drought indicators. And for this pilot methodology, we have decided to focus on the standardized precipitation index that some of my colleagues already mentioned, um, and also that represents anomalies over two and three months, because they, these are anomalies that we can expect an impact to the agriculture sector and the, and the communities and families that depend on the agriculture for uh, sustaining their livelihoods. Next, please. Um, also, what we see is that uh, these data sets, uh, well, we, need, we know that it has a, a good representation of uh, the rainfall in the, you know, across the African continent, but also give us enough flexibility to also um, include other drought indicators, which we already identified as a priority for the drought forecast based financing. Uh, next. 
Um, here you can see as well an overview of the forecasting uh, product that we have been in use and uh, a lot of the, the reach of the forecast. So for this uh, pilot methodology, we have been using the ECMWF uh, assemble uh, forecast that's also the, the long range one that gives us information of the upcoming seven months. Um, and uh, the reason why we chose at this first moment to use um, the ECMWF forecast, and maybe could point out three reasons. The first one is the pre-knowledge that uh, the, for the ECMWF works well in the, in the regions that we would like to design the Inspector Reaction Plan. Uh, the second reason was uh, really the availability of uh, hint cast data. So time series that goes back even to the 1993, so that we can really uh, process and analyze uh, the forecast. And the third reason was basically that the data was available and ready to be analyzed. Um, and as you can see here in the, in the presentation, we can already start using forecasts that comes as early as May to try to understand what could be the potential anomalies at the starting of the, the season within this window of interest for, uh, for applying anticipatory reaction plan. Next. Yeah, you can move to the uh, next slide. Um, yeah, next. Uh, so basically here, I would like just to uh, summarize and bring some key considerations when using these uh, type of uh, forecast and information. Um, next, please. The first point that I would like to bring, um, maybe just to share a little bit of our experience, it's really on the level of understanding that one needs to have in terms of the uncertainty around these data sets and uh, um, how you can uh, how we have been measuring uncertainty of these data sets is really through an extensive assessment of the skill of these uh, forecasting systems it's an, a lot of analytical work that the one needs to do but we need to be sure how the, the model works at specifically times, at specific districts that we would like to intervene, and also for specific, let's say, categories of events that we want to capture. Next. Um, also, what is very important is to have a clear idea on how you expect these data to fit into your decision making process. If you click next, I can give you more or less an example on how we have been using some of these data and some of the dilemmas that we have also been facing with that. So if you can see here on the on the presentation, you see that uh, uh, we wanted to use this forecasting information for feeding one of our anticipatory action plans for a district that's called the Chibuto in Mozambique. Uh, but if we would focus specifically on the months of December and January that you could see highlighted, you see that here we could we also face the dilemma of uh, lead time versus the skill. So if I decided to feed my anticipatory action plan with information that's coming as early as July, um, I would have about four months for uh, implementing my anticipatory action plan. But in fact, um, I would trust a bit better the forecast information if I would wait until September, which would give me only two months for implementing my anticipatory reaction plan. And then at this stage, we really need to be sure that the information uh, that I'm processing, considering it's right and appropriated, according also to the logistics and to the limitations of, for, for example, a country office uh, that needs to implement this anticipatory reaction plan. So when do they need to have the information in hand? And what is the, you know, what is the, the right information to give to them in order to still have uh, enough time to implement these actions? So if you click next. So um, it's just some uh, final remarks that uh, why are we still on this journey of really trying to design um, a forecasting model or let's say a, a, not the forecasting model but the, to apply this forecasting model for a decision making context we're really trying to explore um you know being creative in understanding how we can uh, com combine this information for instance information that's coming early in the season with information that's uh, coming later but more accurate for really uh, design a smart, a, a smart uh, trigger system uh, that will allow us to 
you know, have a higher chance of uh, reaching the community uh, more on time, in order as well to increase the effectiveness of the anticipatory reaction plan for these uh, pilot districts. Um, of course, this is a learning process, so if the audience has any suggestion, any recommendations uh, to give to us, we are well, very willing to embrace them. Um, next, please. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank you all for listening to me and for the opportunity uh, of uh, sharing our experience. Uh, here's my email address. You are more than welcome to reach me out for any questions, uh, recommendations, and suggestions. Um, with that, I would stop here and uh, send it back to Jose. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gabriela. A lot of really valuable information here. Um, I also pick up on uncertainty, which is a big thing for those of us looking to use uh, the forecast. And I think it's a theme also that came across the first two talks uh, and one that we, we should be exploring. What does uncertainty mean and how can it be helpful instead of being seen as a, an hindrance to being able to develop triggers? We will wrap up the talks with my colleague Tinka Valentine. Tinka, we'll, over to you. Thank you. So my name is Tinka Valentine. I'm part of the Center for Humanitarian Data. And I will just want to build up upon Gabriella's talk uh, to give a few more examples of how climate models can be used for anticipatory action. And if you can go to the next slide, um, you can see all the countries that Orcha has been doing piloting on anticipatory action. Uh, and I will highlight a few. And in all these countries, really, the climate models are a, an essential part of the of the puzzle. So if we go to the next, the first country is Ethiopia. And in Ethiopia, we looked at the shock of drought. So actually, exactly the same phenomenon that uh, WFP is looking at. And we took a very similar approach because we also looked at a lack of precipitation. But instead of looking at the SPI, we used uh, the probability of below average precipitation. And the reason we chose this indicator is because we wanted to include forecasts from different levels. So global models like IRIs, then regional models, as you can see here from IPEC, and also the national forecast. And this was the one indicator that was available on all these levels. Um, so this shows really nicely to me that you have to understand your climate models, but also adjust uh, your projects to the context. And another example, if you go to the next slide, thank you, uh, is Malawi. And in Malawi, we also looked at a shock that is related to a lack of precipitation, but it's a bit different because we looked at dry spells. And dry spells are two months with basic, uh, two weeks, sorry, with basically no rainfall. Um, and this is a lot harder to predict because when I was talking to Gabriela, she explained it actually quite nicely that drought is predicting which team will win in a soccer match, and then dry spells is predicting in which minute a goal will be scored. Um, so it's a very precise phenomenon and it's not that much explored in the anticipatory reaction community. So what we first did is assessing a wide range of climate models. Um, and we saw that they have a really difficult time predicting these dry spells because the, it's really at the extreme of the precipitation spectrum. Um, so what we did at the end is that we took the monthly precipitation as a proxy for the occurrence of a dry spell. So if there's less monthly precipitation, there's a higher probability of a dry spell. And then we used uh, one of the forecasts from ECMWF that uh, predicts this precipitation, as you can see in the slide. And um, it was still having a hard time detecting these dry spells. So in the end, we had to be creative and we settled for a hybrid trigger where part of the trigger is based on observational data. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it shows how you can combine different uh, sources of data. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so we have been talking a lot about drought related phenomenon, but climate models are really widely applicable. So another model we heavily depend on is uh, GLOFAS and this is used for flooding. Um, so we use this in Nepal and Bangladesh um, and we will actually um, organize a separate webinar on flooding, but here again, it's informed by climate models. And then another really cool project uh, we do together with the Red Cross or 510 specifically is in the Philippines on typhoons. And 510 build a model that can predict the percentage of damaged buildings. And as part of this, uh, as part of this model, they use the storm track and the associated wind speeds as input, as is shown in the right. We can go to the next slide. So all these examples um, show to me really nicely that you that climate models. There's so much power in climate models, that, and we have to 
uh, use them more. And at the same time, you have to understand their limitations. What can you use them for and what not? So I show, show a few examples. If you want to know more about Ocha's work, you can find everything in the first link. And then I think another big obstacle currently is that a lot of the data uh, is a bit hard to access, even if it's open source and especially hard to process. So we are working on an open source code toolbox um, that is available for everyone in the second link. And we're happy to collaborate on this. So get in touch with us um, if you're interested. So that is it for me. Uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Tinka. I would invite you to uh, and all the speakers to come back um, with your cameras on so we can kick off this uh, discussion and remind the participants uh, that we can you can submit your questions uh, through the Q&A feature of uh, the product. So the first question I, I would maybe to kiss, kick us off with this discussion, um, I'm curious to hear um, every panelist's thoughts on being retrospective for a moment and reflective on what we have done so far as a community. What have you learned or what have we learned from using climate models for anticipatory reaction? What would be kind of one great good takeaway that you would like to share to kick us off? I could jump in if, if no one else. Go for it, start. Andrew. Yeah, something that I've learned and I think is becoming more uh, important um, is to normalize the discussion of the constraints of the of the systems that we're building. It's exciting in the past, especially five, six years, to see the evolution of forecast-based action. It's inspiring to see different groups work together, collaborate, that have maybe talked about it before. Anticipatory action is a platform to bring different groups, different sectors together for sure. Um, however, there have been situations where, uh, looking back, perhaps expectations weren't clear on what the ability of the forecasts are, what the abilities are. Um, and without being clear about the constraints, I don't think we could fully embrace the opportunities, especially now when we're moving into a place where we're scaling up a lot of the, the programs that we're designing. Again, it's, a, it's an exciting moment, but it's also, I think, critical to make sure that we're clear and normalized talking about the constraints in order to unlock the opportunities in a more sustainable way. Feel free to come in, uh, Zaudu, Tinka, or Gabriela. Yeah, perhaps I can go next. Um, I think what I've mostly learned over these, uh, well, let's say, past two years of experience in trying to well, design these uh, um, drought forecast-based finance. And, I mean, it's the starting point. It's a uh, it's a very complex hazard to to work with uh, the, the droughts. And uh, I think that um, the first level of complexity to try to overcome it's really having all the stakeholders around the table and uh, really trying to incorporate what other definitions of drought are. I think that is, uh, is something that um, perhaps was the first obstacle that we had to encounter because, uh, you know, when you, we bring in the information of the risk, uh, I think the way that this information was digested and processed by different people on the table, it's, you know, it means different things. So I think this is was, let's say, uh, the first thing that we had to overcome. Uh, but at the same time, I see that, the, you know, by using this type of forecasting information, especially the ones that, you know, you can get the information so early in advance, it really opens an opportunity for uh, implementing anticipatory action uh, based on this information. And it's, uh, it's just very interesting to see, you know, the, to understand how these uh, products can really feed into like a, a decision chain, a decision process that is suitable for also the operations that uh, you would like to support with. Um, some examples uh, that we have, um, uh, for, for instance, in, the, in our work in Zimbabwe, you know, is understanding that, uh, you know, they need a, a specific amount of time in order to implement the action. So, uh, it's uh, you know it's also important to understand when should we stop looking at the forecasting system and really move into actions. We still to have uh, you know enough time to uh, have these actions on the ground, reaching the community, and still being effective. So, 
even though we can try to come up with, you know, a methodology that's strong and robust, I think there are so many decision making aspects that it's, uh, you know, that needs to fit the system and also gets the works to be very interesting that, you know, the communication parts and uh, bringing all these people together. So uh, I think that's most of my remarks from uh, the experience. <clears throat> If I may absolutely yes please I would do come in uh, yeah um uh, I think um uh, there are two points I wanted to uh, raise um observing um, how our forecast been uh, evolving I think there is uh, um, significant room uh, for improvement and uh, that requires really um, uh, research um but however good forecast that uh, one can provide, co-production is really important. And that is understanding of uh, what the forecast is really, understanding the limitation. And it's not a one-off kind of engagement, but uh, um, a continual uh, engagement with the stakeholders. So the, stakeholder, they, so the user knows what the limitations are and also the, um, the forecaster also knows what are actually are needed. So this continual interaction uh, will uh, definitely improve uh, the use of climate uh, products and services. Thank you. And that's a perfect segue. Thank you for that, uh, Zaudu. Um, into, unfortunately, we are up against time, so I want to make sure to ask each one of you, what do you think would be helpful to help you in your own work? So for the climate scientists, what would be helpful to hear from the humanitarians who are consuming your products and using them in the field? And for the humanitarian data scientists, what else would you like to see coming from uh, the climate scientists uh, community? If I may say again, um, shortly, um, I think from the humanitarian side, uh, in addition to getting the feedback, uh, requests um, that um, the humanitarian side wants uh, this product actually give us some impetus, impetus uh, to uh, develop products. I think uh, what Tinka does is um, a good example, really. Um, somehow um, um, she asked us to develop some products and um, uh, the, um, that gives a good um, um, prospect for the providers to uh, grow um, and provide services and feedback from the humanitarian side is also important to improve um, service. Thank you. Andrew Gabriela, would you like to chime in on that? Go, go ahead, Gabriela. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, uh, yeah, I find myself in this interface between a humanitarian and scientist, but uh, maybe something that it's has been uh, really difficult to work with. I mean, working with droughts and maybe we can, uh, you know, spread the words to the scientific community that maybe they can help us out. It's really the, the you know, the understanding of the droughts and the impacts. It's, uh, it's something that's extremely difficult to categorize and to have good records on data or maybe strong methodologies on how you can really grasp, uh, you know, from um, some sort of analytical process what we can expect in terms of drought impacts. And uh, this is an exercise that we daily facing like, okay, how can we better link our, you know, our trigger system to impacts that are felt on the ground? And uh, I mean, the, the key, uh, you know, source for unlocking this uh, puzzle, it's data. And currently we we are still facing with this limitation, but uh, well, spreading the word to the scientific community, maybe they have as a, you know, some uh, tips and advice to us on how we can, uh, yeah, deal better with this uh, situation. Yeah, and I, if I could jump in, I know we we're a bit over time, but building building off what Zedu and Gabriella are saying, um, I, I could summarize my thoughts in three points. One is, and also recognizing my position between climate science and the humanitarian sector, uh, reinforcing that space, that in between space, the translator broker position. This is a this is a role, and it is emerging as an even important, more important one. 
Um, my background is in meteorology, but I very much operate mostly at that at that interface. And so I think just to work together to describe the roles and responsibilities around that translator role so it could become a career path on its own, I think would help not only anticipatory action, but also the climate scientists, meteorologists, and the humanitarian sector. The second point I would say is I, I suggest or I recommend humanitarian community being a bit more um, comfortable or how do we move to becoming more comfortable with asking some tough questions to scientists when data and forecasts are provided. Sometimes the answer might be, this is not helpful. Sometimes it might be, we don't, we don't see value in integrating this into decision-making process. It's a pretty map, but it could actually make things more complicated for us. That's the reality, and especially in complex humanitarian settings, for example, refugee camp management and as such, this is a big challenge um, that we face. The third one is on data collection. Um, the science improves when we have higher quality data, not necessarily higher granularity data, although that can help, but knowing what the impact was for di different extreme events is very helpful for us to train and build our models. So if the humanitarian community um, and let's say data collection more broadly, also speaking to the open street map community and, and other areas, social media with collecting data, how do we maintain you know, a level of quality that is appropriate for training and building models? These are questions that I think are emerging and we need to ask more. So thank you. Fantastic points and uh, very well noted that we can ask harder questions. Uh, we will take you to word on that. Um, very exciting. Thank you so much to our speakers. Unfortunately, we are already out of time, but we quite frankly kind of expected that to be the case because this is such a rich topic. We saw this first connection as really the beginning of a conversation that we hope to continue facilitate between the two communities, perhaps as this translator role, we, we want to help our communities get together and really learn from one another in a more efficient and rapid way. Um, so please do uh, expect from us uh, additional events that may be more targeted on specific topics uh, pertaining to climate um, models in general. Keep an eye on our, the center website for announcements of future events. Again, thank you to our speakers and to everyone in the, in the audience for your participation. We hope to see you at a future event and we really appreciate your support today. See you next time to everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.